I, I have a friend who used to be very embarrassed to go out to restaurants with his parents. Do you know why? His parents were poor tippers. The whole family would go and, and they'd eat and they'd pay their bill and then they'd get up to leave and the dad would stand up and he'd pull a dollar bill out of his wallet and he'd put it there on the table. And if anyone kind of gave him grief about it, he'd get defensive and he'd be like, what? That's a good tip around here. And so my friend was embarrassed. My friend would actually find ways, you know, after everyone left, he, he'd find excuses to go back to the table so he could sneak some more money down on the table because he was embarrassed. Anyone here ever been out with a lousy tipper? What's that like? How does that make you feel? Terrible? Because uh, you know, even, you know, let's say you split the bill and, and you pay your share and you put a good tip down for your share, uh, but that other person doesn't, you still feel like you're the cheap guy, right? Like you're the ungrateful person. Because, hey, one way or another, we've all learned. We know what the proper tipping etiquette is, don't we? I'll prove it here. What is the benchmark for tipping at a sit-down restaurant in our culture? <laughs> Maybe we don't all know. 15%, right? Yeah, we all know that. Many of us abide by it. You know, on occasion, if the, you know, if the situation is right, we might be more generous than that. But we know 50% baseline for tipping. You do not tip less than that. Now, I bring it up today. Oh my, okay, well, we'll get to that later. Uh, I bring it up today because we talk about a most uncomfortable topic. One we've kind of been tiptoeing around and dancing around as we've been talking in this congregation about God's desire for us to be generous with our wealth, God's desire for us to be generous in giving to the poor and giving to the work of his kingdom through the church. We come to this topic of, this question of, how much? How much do I give to the church? How much of my wealth do I give toward the work of the kingdom of God? And, and this topic brings us back to this idea of benchmark numbers. Because that benchmark number of uh, 15% for tipping, we know that. But it, it's kind of like that. There's also a benchmark for giving in the church that people often cite or discuss or talk about. And what is it? 10%, yeah, you know, you were right there, right? Uh, or it's called a tithe, which means 10%. And we say, just as we would tip no less than 15%, the notion in church that we would give no less than 10% of our income, that's uh, the benchmark. We've all heard it. We know it. And this is a, a difficult thing for some people, this idea of giving 10% or tithing. Because, well, 10%, that's a big chunk of our income. Most of us, when we give 10% of our income, we feel that. That puts a pinch on us. So there's that reality there. But that's not only, only it. See, there's a lot of confusion and misunderstanding in, in the New Testament church when we, we talk about tithing or giving 10%. Because, well, isn't that an Old Testament thing? And, and how is that tied in with what we live now? And if it's just in the Old Testament, you know, what's the point of doing it now? There are a lot of questions and confusion. So I thought to kind of clear things up today so we can cut through all this and see what really, when we answer the question, how much? What do we do? I want, I want to trace back a little bit to the Old Testament and look at what the Old Testament said about this idea of giving 10%, first of all. Because this idea of tithing or giving 10%, it's part of the covenant law. The covenant law, God gave his people Israel through Moses uh, th that set them aside as a separate group of people for God. And so, so the idea was, you obey this covenant law, this makes you my people. This, this law tells you what righteousness is, and you live according to this righteousness. And in that covenant law, God told people that 10% of your flocks, 10% of your crops, or any sort of money you might earn throughout the year, 10% is returned to God. It is given to the tabernacle, or later the temple, after the tabernacle was a tent, and then, then they had a, a permanent structure in the temple. And it was given to that, it was given to the temple, to help operate things there because they had operating expenses. You got to keep up the building. You got people, you got priests, you got Levites working there. You have to provide for them. So God said, give 10% back to me for those purposes. And that was all part of that temple system, which is all part uh, of that covenant law that God had given the people to set them apart. So the idea is that when the people of God live in obedience to this law, well, then they're righteous. You got to keep the law be righteous. 
So God says, give 10%, you give 10%. It was a command. Now fast forward to our era. And we have the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 14. He says, we're no longer under the covenant law, but we're under grace. You see, the law was impossible for people to keep. And God knew that going in. He knew it was there to show people it's impossible to be righteous on your own. It was impossible for anyone to keep. So God sends his son Jesus to live out and to keep the law for us. Jesus lived it. Jesus fulfilled the law for us. So since Jesus did it, we are no longer under the law. Isn't it wonderful? Obedience to the law does not bring us righteousness. Righteousness comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. So as followers of Jesus, we no longer have to obey that covenant law for righteousness. So I can't stand up here and tell you that you have to give 10% of your income in order to obey the law of God. God says you have to give 10% of your income. Because righteousness comes through Jesus Christ alone. See, the Old Testament command to give a tithe, it's not applicable. And so I see some of you, your eyes lighting up. You're like, woohoo, party time. I got 10% of my income back. Yeah, party at my house. Food, drinks, fun. What kind of drinks are you serving? No, we're all excited, right? Well, maybe not so fast. Because beyond legalistic covenant obedience, there is another way of looking at tithing in the New Testament church. We look at tithing now as an act of worship. It's not an act of obedience. It's an act of worship. So we no longer give 10% to keep the law. But we might look to giving 10% as a way of honoring God. As a way of worshiping our great God. We talk about tithing as worship. Tithing is worship. Dean Shriver has written about it. And he says, it's an act by which we acknowledge that God is both our superior and our source of blessing. It expresses our allegiance to God and our thanksgiving to God. And the interesting thing about this idea of tithing as thanksgiving, not tithing as keeping the law, we actually see this idea of tithing as worship in the Bible before the law is given. See, the law is given starting in Exodus, the second book of the Bible. But we see tithing as worship in the book of Genesis, the first book. In Genesis 14, we see Abram, later on renamed Abraham. He's the, the father of the Israelite nation. Uh, we see him, God gives him victory over his enemies, and Abraham gets the plunder, and he takes 10% of it, and he gives it to the priest Melchizedek, the priest of God, as a way of acknowledging God's sovereignty. Now that's Abraham. Fast forward uh, 14 chapters later to Genesis chapter 28. We see Jacob, Abraham's grandson. God reveals himself to Jacob. And Jacob, he, he uh, is in so in awe of God and so worshipful of God that he, he makes th- this, this dedication to God. He says, from now on, 10% of everything I get, God, I'm giving it back to you. Ten percent. You see, for Jacob, tithing as worship became a natural expression of his dedication, of his devotion to God. And so for us, tithing as worship becomes an almost instinctive way for us to express that we are allied with God, our allegiance to God, and that we are thankful to God for what he has given us. This idea of tithing as worship. It's kind of what the Apostle Paul was getting at in our passage today from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You see, Paul's writing to believers in Corinth, and he's writing to them, bragging about the believers in Macedonia. And he's saying, look how generous these people in Macedonia are. You should be this generous too. Uh, Jim, show us what Paul writes to them in in verse 5 of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. They even did more than we had hoped for. Their first action was to give. Give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to. Notice he says their first action was to give themselves to God. The, the, the first thing in their mind, of everything else they could be thinking of, the first thing they wanted to give themselves to God. Right there, that's a challenge, because how many of us can say that? Our first action 
is to give ourselves to God. But he says the first section, and notice uh, again how the Apostle Paul equates their giving of wealth, their giving of money. He equates that with them giving themselves to God because, hey, money, it's a huge part of our lives. It's who we are. When we give money as an act of worship, we are declaring to, the, to the God and to the world, I am giving myself to God. I give myself to you. And notice again what else Paul says about their giving. It was just as God wanted them to do. It's just what they want. It's a sacrifice of praise that pleases God. Giving as an act of worship. It's what God wants us to do. What makes what Paul is saying all that much more impressive, this the giving from the Macedonians as an act of worship, it's made clear when we look in verse 2 that Paul says, hey, these are poor people. And these people have been tested by troubles. Now, some of that, or both of those things, might sound familiar to you. You might be sitting there saying, well, I don't have a whole lot. You know, just like the Macedonians, I don't have a whole lot. Or maybe like the Macedonians, I face down trouble after trouble after trouble. But certainly, the story of this church over the past couple years. But, but then, Paul goes on to write that they were full of abundant joy. Look, they're poor, they've been tested by troubles, but they're full of abundant joy. The joy of the Lord. It comes from them knowing that Jesus has come, and through faith in Jesus Christ, they are given grace for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And so, they are full of joy, and their joy overflowed in the generosity, in their giving. When you're joyful, you were generous. God has given us all reasons to be joyful. In verse 3, Paul writes that the Macedonians loved God and worshipped Him so deeply, they gave even more than they could afford. And what, what really gets you, he says, they did it of their own free will. No one's there twisting their arm. No one was there saying, you need to do this. No, they, they did it of their own free will. And Paul follows in verse 4, he says, they begged. They begged us to let them share what they had. What little they had, they begged us to let them share it. You see, they want to give to God out of worship. The law of Moses, what it says about 10% or whatever, no, not going to hold them back. They're not, this isn't about uh, keeping the rules or meeting an obligation. <coughs> this is about them desiring to worship God in their giving. You know, this idea of worshiping through giving takes me back uh, to one of the most holy opportunities I ever had to give a gift to the kingdom of God. And it wasn't holy because anything I did, certainly, or anything that was going on, but because what God was doing there. I remember it was when I was in San Antonio. I was on vacation, and it was probably the most lavish vacation I've ever taken for myself. I was spending lots of money on myself, you know, between airfare, and I was the only, I was the only one uh, there, so I was just paying for a place all by myself to stay there for a week. And, and we were going, I, I met a friend from college down there, we were just going, you know, we ate out every meal because, you know, well, what else are you going to do? And so, you know, we went to SeaWorld, we went to uh, Natural Underground Bridge Caverns, all the stuff we were spending money on. And so later in the week, you know, got around and we're like, well, we haven't even gone to downtown San Antonio yet, so let's just spend the day there. So we're there. We, we went and we were underwhelmed by the Alamo, as everyone warned us we would be. So we went to the Alamo and we had plans to get to the River Walk. If you know San Antonio, you know these things. And somewhere between those, that place, we're walking through downtown, and the guy comes up to us on the street. And he's asking for money. He's collecting money for some inner city ministry. And I wish I could remember what that ministry was, but I, I can't. Uh, but it, he was asking for money for this. And, and so right away, if someone asks you for money on a donation on the street, and what do you think? You're like, come on, you legit. So I start asking this guy questions about his faith, about the ministry. And this guy knew his stuff. Uh, and he, he, he knew it all. And not only did he know his stuff, but what he was telling me about this ministry, it just seemed so excellent. It was like, it seemed like God was doing really exciting things there. And my regret was that, hey, I, I'm leaving in a couple days. I can't see this ministry in action. I don't remember what it was about. I remember feeling that way. So I'm like, this guy's asking me for a contribution. And I'm standing there thinking, because you know, I've, always, I've always given my tithe to my local congregation. I, at the time, I was worshiping here, so I, I, I gave my tithe to this congregation. So I'm thinking, I, I, my money's spoken for. And so I can tell this man, I don't have any money to give you. But I was spending so much money on myself. That's a lie. I mean, it's a flat-out lie. 
So I'm thinking, if I give this man anything, well, this might affect my vacation. But out of worship for God, out of what God was doing there, I opened up my wallet and I gave him some money. I don't even remember how much it was. And I remember thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel this a little bit. But I also remember thinking, it, it's not that much. It wasn't overwhelming. But this man, you could tell it was more than what he was used to getting from people when he asked for donations on the street. Because he thanked me over and over again. Oh, look how generous you were. I, I didn't know such a small gift could make you look so generous. He's like, thank you for being so generous. But I hadn't done it for the man. I had done it for God and see the work of the kingdom go forward as an act of worship. Giving is an act of worship. See, that was almost 15 years ago. And, and of all the other opportunities I've had to give as an act of worship since then, this one sticks out of my mind as holy. Because it wasn't easy to let go of that money that I was planning on spending on myself. And you all know how that is. But I did it as an act of worship. Just as God wanted me to do. See, God gets done telling the Corinthians about how, how generous the Macedonians are. And he follows up by, by encouraging them to do likewise. Jim, show us what it says in verse 7. The Apostle Paul writes, Since you excel in so many ways, in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. Now, let's face it. Paul knows how to butter people up, doesn't he? He's like, oh, you excel in so many ways. But he's not lying. He lists the things that they excel. And he's like saying, since, since you've been so true in the faith, you, you've been so dedicated to God and God's cause, and you've really been living out your faith, and you've excelled at that. Don't miss this opportunity. This one place, don't, I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss excelling in the opportunity to worship God by being generous in your giving. See, Paul goes on in verse 9 to, to, tell the, to remind the Corinthians, hey, you remember Jesus Christ, how he made himself poor. He came and gave up everything so that we might be rich in the kingdom of God. The implication is we should be following the, the example of Jesus Christ. We should be willing to give up our entire selves. And so Paul, in discussing all this stuff in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he gives us this picture of giving as an act of worship. This wonderful picture of it. But we're not talking about just giving as an act of worship. We're talking about tithing as an act of worship. And you're sitting there thinking, well, Pastor Mark, where does the tithing part come from? Where does the 10% come into play? Well, to answer this, I do have to lean on the teachings from John W. H. Walton and Andrew E. Hill. Because they write that if 10% was considered an acceptable portion by God as an expression of gratitude in the Old Testament... Why should we view it any differently today? Look, we're no longer under the command, the law, to give 10%. But if God, it's the same God. If he said, this much honors me in your giving, what has changed that? It's not a command. It's an opportunity to worship. You see, just like 15% is considered to be a benchmark for tipping, we might look at this 10% as a benchmark for giving to God. You know, when you're out, and Pam commented on this, when you're out and you're a customer, your appreciation for what has been done or the service or the blessing given you, it's demonstrated by the size tip you give, right? So if, if someone really doesn't care about you, what do you do, Pam? You might leave a lesser tip. You know, but when we get good service, we appreciate it, we leave a 15% and maybe more. More. What we are giving to God is an act of worship that demonstrates our gratitude and appreciation to him. And this in the case of tipping, there are times when the situation calls for a contribution exceeding the benchmark. Here's a story from my own life. About, uh, uh, a couple years back now, my family and I, we were heading down to downtown Pittsburgh to the Benenham Center to see a show, as we do once or twice a year. And we left early in the evening so we could get and, and go to dinner at the Spaghetti Warehouse, um, when Spaghetti Warehouse was still there. And so we get there, and we give our names, and we wait to be seated. And we could see into the restaurant, like there were a lot of empty tables. It was a bit early in the evening yet, but they weren't seating anyone. And so we waited and waiting and other people came in and they weren't being seated either. And we waited and we waited and we waited and we waited and we waited. Way too long we waited. 
especially since no one was being seated. Finally, I have no idea what was going on. I don't know if they were short-staffed or what happened. We finally got seated. At this time, we're looking at the time, we're looking at our watches, and we're thinking, uh, we don't have time for the restaurant experience now. Uh, if we go through all of this, we're going to miss at least the first part of the show. So we explain this to our waiter, and we say, if you could rush this along, we'll make it worth your time. And so, since we had been waiting for so long, we all knew what we wanted. We ordered it right away. He didn't have to come back. And he goes and puts the order in, and he comes back almost immediately with our waters, you know, because we always order water, and, and our salads, which you get. And so, we're eating our salad. We're not even halfway done with our salads. And, oh, there's the main course already. It was like, here it is already. And so, we eat. It was the fastest sit-down restaurant experience I've ever had. Not because we were eating so fast, just because it was all there. It was like McDonald's couldn't have done it faster. You know what I mean? And so, we got done so fast that we actually got to the bedroom and we had to stand around waiting for them to open uh, the theater to get to our seats. It, it, that's just how fast it was. And so when we were getting ready to leave the spaghetti warehouse, we were so thankful to that waiter for what he had done for us, for how he had really blessed us, that we left a 100% tip. Now, we don't do that very often. In fact, I don't remember any time, other time in my life where we've done that. But the situation merited it. So we did. It's likewise, when we're specially blessed by God, whether it might be an occasional thing in your life, you get a special blessing. Some of you might be sitting there thinking, I'm especially blessed all the time. I've got, I've got way more than I could ever need or use. Well, we could use it, but way more than I ever need. Whether, regardless, when you are especially blessed by God, you give more. You exceed the benchmark. You see, the tithe, this 10% thing, it isn't the cap of the heart of worship. It's the baseline. We talk about giving in the New Testament church. We're told to give as we have been blessed. So that's what Paul gets to in verses 11 and 12 of our scripture passage today. He says, give according to how you've been blessed. Don't give according to what you don't have. That's not what he's asking. You don't have a lot. You don't have to give as much as everybody else. But give according to how much you've been blessed. It's about the heart. Show us, Jim. What Paul says in first, uh, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 12. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. Not you give it because you have to. Not you give it because everybody else is looking. Not even because it's expected. But you desire to worship God. And so it's acceptable. You, you see... In the Old Testament, God commanded people, give 10% of your flocks and your crops. You got to do it. In our era, God's given us so much more than he gave the people in the Old Testament. We have been given Jesus Christ himself. We are given the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We are given the fellowship within the church. We are, are given the opportunity to live in the most affluent nation to ever exist in the world. And on top of that, every day, God gives us individual blessings. God has given us so much. Give according to how you have been blessed. You decide whether that should be more or less than a tithe. Because ultimately, when we talk about tithing as worship, it's not about a percentage. It's about the overflow of your heart. When we are like the Macedonian believers, and our first action is to give ourselves to God, then any amount we give according to that is pleasing to God. Whether it's above or below that, whatever benchmark it is. Giving is an act of worship of God. It's giving to a God who has saved you by giving you his son. It's an act of worship. When you give, you are giving to the ministry of Christ. Look, you are not giving out of a need to fulfill some Old Testament law. You're not giving out of some misguided notion of legalism where I'm good, I'm better, uh, better than you maybe because I gave, I gave more, I gave this amount. You're not even given uh, to meet your commitment or obligation uh, to pay your share of paying the pastor or keeping the lights on in the building. No. It is a loving, worshipful gift under the kingdom of God that the ministry of Christ might go forward. I want you to look at it this way. Most of us have been benefactors of the ministry of Christ through the church, 
You know, uh, most of us you know, have experience growing up maybe in Sunday school or VBS or participating in the various ministries, the various fellowships, the different things that have come through the body of Christ, the church. And even though many of us, we were brought up in the faith by our parents or our families, we still have had our faith strengthened by the ministry of Christ through the church. Some of us, maybe most of us, would know very little about the grace of God if not for the ministry of Christ through the church. So get this. If not for others before us, giving generously as worship, all those blessings we have received from the church throughout the years, we wouldn't have received them. We might not even be committed to Jesus today because we wouldn't know better. And so we'd be without hope, hope in this life, hope in the next life. See, we've been blessed because others worshiped God by giving. Don't ask me why, but that's, that's how God does it. If you want to argue with me, fine, but you're not actually arguing with me. You're, you're arguing with God. And I hope you're prepared for that argument. I would advise you not to do it. But we've been blessed because others worship God by giving. And now, just as we have been blessed, we too give as an act of worship. And through that act of worship, others will be blessed as we were under the glory of God. Let's pray.